Okay, so we just got into 7.4 in the chapter of the book that we're using and talking about coterminal angles. And so recall we were looking at angles and drawing angles. Um, so for example, let's say it says um, draw theta, which is equal to negative pi force and determine the quadrant. Theta lays, lies in. Okay, so I usually, when I'm drawing my, my um, angles, I will do my X and Y coordinate. We know that to start our angle, we're going to put it in standard position. So the initial ray is on the positive x axis. And then it's telling me to rotate that negative pi force. It's negative, so that tells me the direction is going to be clockwise. And then we need to, if you don't remember where pi force is, or, and if it helps you, change that to degrees for now. Well, negative pi force is equivalent to, in degrees, is negative 45 degrees. And so again, if you don't remember how to do that, this is where you would multiply by 180 over pi. And that reduces to negative 45 degrees. So negative 45 degrees, that's halfway between this positive x-axis and the negative y-axis. Okay, um, there's an infinite number of angles that could get us back to this terminal side right here that this angle negative pi force has gotten us to. So any angle that would give us the same terminal side, those are called um, coterminal angles. So any angle that is the same terminal side are called co-terminal angles. Okay, so can anyone think of an angle that would get us back right here? Um, would, it, would you just do 30, 360 minus 45? Okay, so we could try 360 uh, minus 45. And so that would work. So that gives us 315 degrees. So that though, so that would tell us, right, we would be going the opposite direction. We'd be going clockwise, counterclockwise. So that's 90 degrees, 180, 270, plus 45 degrees right here. So this is 315 degrees. And so that definitely is a coterminal angle. Anybody else? Um, could you also um, add 360 degrees? Okay, so if we added 360 degrees from the, the negative 45? Yes. Okay, so let's say, um, well, yeah. Because, so basically adding 360 degrees to negative 45 
is doing, it would get us back what we just did, right? Because it's positive and then a minus. It's, so that would get oh, us. I meant, I meant subtracting, sorry. Yeah, so definitely. So if we subtract 360, that is going to give us, um, it would give us right here, right? This is our 45 degrees and then plus another negative 360. So it's a full circle and that gives us back here. So you're right. So negative 45 minus 360 degrees. So this is negative 405 degrees. So this would be another coterminal angle. So notice that adding any multiple of an integer of 360, 360 just goes a full circle, it's gonna give us back to that same spot. So if you have theta is an angle, then technically theta plus 360 degrees times K is a coterminal angle. And I'm going to define K in a second. So that's, um, I'm going to just do it with math notation K contained in. And then you're going to see this funky little, this funky capital letter Z. And that means that K is an integer. So just again, real quick, what it does it mean to be an integer? So it means that it's your whole numbers, um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, on forever, but also the negative of those whole numbers. So you're coming in from negative infinity, dot, 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 negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Professor, what's that next to the K? K, that is like a, that means contained in. So it's contained in that set. It's, a, it's in the set of integers. This, this reads K is contained and that's this funky little E set, E symbol. So basically this wouldn't work if K was a half because a half times 360 is 180 degrees and that would not, adding 180 degrees or subtracting 180 degrees would not get us back to that same terminal side. So in, instead of just adding 360, another way to write that, if we're thinking about it in radian measures, we can say theta plus two pi K is also a terminal angle. Okay, so that's going to be really, really helpful for us. Because if we can work th with things that have the coterminal angles, some coterminal angles might be easier to work with. Um, Angles might be worse than others. Okay, so that's a good question. Okay, so let's talk about reference angles. So reference angles we're going to be doing all semester two. Um, reference angles.
These are acute angles. So acute angles means it's a number or it's an angle between zero and 90 degrees. Um, that are formed with a terminal side of the angle and the x-axis. Okay, so for example, if you had theta is equal to 130 degrees, so let's first graph theta. And so again, starting at the positive x axis, you're going to rotate positive, um, it's positive, so you're going to go counterclockwise, and you're going to go 130 degrees. So hitting the positive y-axis is 90, so we need 40 more degrees, so just estimate 40 degrees. And then we want to find the reference angle. Of theta. Okay, so by definition, it said that a reference angle it had to form with a terminal side. So we know that it's forming in this um, side that's in the second quadrant and the x axis. But it's an acute angle. So it has to be forming with this negative part of the x axis. So let's call this, this is, I'm gonna call reference angles and I don't, I don't know if I've ever even seen this in a book, but theta with a subscript of a R kind of standings for the reference angle of theta. So we need to figure out what that angle is. So anyone know how to figure out the angle there that would form between the negative x-axis and the terminal side? You could do 180 minus 130. Right. So we know that a full line right there was 180, but if we subtract off the 130 degrees that we already swept out, then we would be left with this piece. So theta sub r, this is going to equal 180 minus 150. I'm sorry, 130. So that's going to give us the 50. Okay, so our reference angle is going to be 50 degrees. So same idea, but let's do it now. Let's say you had theta is equal to 800 degrees. So let's first graph it. Okay, so I know it's going to make a full circle every 360 degrees. And so this has multiple 360s in here. So if we look at this, 800 minus 360. Oops. So this gives me um, five, half, seven, that's 440 degrees. 
And so now if I have this 440 degrees and I subtract off 360, so that tells me I've subtracted off 360 twice. So I'm making a full rotation 360 plus another full rotation, which I know is 720. And then what I have left after I've made two full rotations is 80 degrees. And so I'd have to go up 80 degrees. So about right here. And that is going to give us our 800 degrees. So what is the reference angle? So it has to be acute, so it has to be between zero and 90 degrees and it has to form with the x-axis. So either the positive or the negative. So one of them is always going to give you an acute angle. And so in order to get it acute smaller than 90 degrees, in this case, it has to be formed with the positive x-axis. So what angle is uh, who's that's Did I, I make a mistake in here? Okay, so the reference angle is going to be eighty degrees. So if I start at the initial side and I went eighty degrees, would it be ten degrees? Would it be 10 degrees? Is that what you're saying? It has to be with the x-axis though. 10 degrees would get me up to the up to the y-axis. And so it would be 80 degrees. So if that would have been 10 degrees, it would have been 80. Um, it would have been. Oh wait, I'm confused now. Um, so let's just do a couple more. Or, um, what if it was two hundred and twenty five degrees? So first draw it. And so 225 degrees, I know I'm starting again, initial uh, standard position. So 90 degrees, this would get me 180. So I think to myself, 180 to how much more gets me up to 225, which is 45. So that would get me right here. So we have to bring, figure out what the angle is between the x-axis and this terminal side. And since the x-axis that would make it acute would be this piece, the negative part of the x-axis. And so if we're coming from here, the negative part of the x-axis and just sweeping from there down to the terminal side, what is that measure of the angle? 45 degrees. Yeah. So this measure right in here is just 45 degrees. Really what this is going to help us do is we know if we should know our trig functions between um, that zero degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees and 90 degrees. 
these numbers, if we can rewrite them and then use the reference angle. So it's going to end up that any trig function at 225 degrees is going to equal um, that trig function at 45 degrees. It could be the opposite sign, though. It might be positive or negative of that 225. We'll talk about that in a minute, though. So there's a difference between reference angle and a coterminal angle. Reference angle is just that acute angle between the terminal side and the, one of the um, x-axis. So there's only one reference angle where there's an, an infinite number of coterminal angles that infinite number of angles we could have started at that terminal or the initial side and what could leave us ending at this terminal side. Um, so find the reference angle of negative seven pi six. Okay, so I noticed that my, that I ignored the pi for a second. I noticed that that six, that in the denominator um, is smaller than the seven in the numerator. So I know I'm going over a pi. So I know I'm going over 180 degrees, if you wanna think of it that way. I also noticed that it's a negative angle, so I have to be going clockwise instead of counterclockwise. Okay, so making a full line, so this is pi halves, plus another piece here is pi. And then I think to myself, well, what, what I would have to add to get up to seven pi six. If it helps you convert this to degrees and hopefully soon after converting a lot of times you'll start seeing what it is. And so another way to think of it is, well, we just went pi, let's see what's left. So if we looked at, and let's ignore the negative again, let's look at seven pi six minus a pi. Well, in order to add or subtract those, we need a common denominator. So let's make this six pi six. So seven pi six minus six pi six is one pi six or just pi six. So I know that I have to, from pi, go up pi six, which is 30 degrees. So I know that this right here is our negative seven pi six. But our reference angle, that has to form with the x-axis and the terminal side. So this angle in here is Well, basically, kind of just worked that out when we were trying to figure out how far we were going to go from that negative x-axis up to get to that terminal side. So our reference angle is pi 6. So I'm not sure uh, where I got lost, but um, in the beginning, I thought you had said because the numerator is bigger than de the denominator, there was going to be a full circle. Oh, oh, if it was more than, um, no, it's only would go be a half a circle if it's, if it goes in there um, between one and two times, then it would just be a half a circle and a little more or whatever. Two pi is a full rotation. 
So if this had been like 13 in the numerator, then I would have noticed six had gone into 13 twice. And so that would have made a full rotation. But I see that six goes into seven one time. And so I know that one pi is just a half of a circle. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, I... could, you, could you convert that into degrees just to see like Mm hmm. So in, in a lot of you might be doing this and I would have been doing this too when I started this class is converting things into degrees just so that I it, to me and probably for you guys two degrees makes more sense. Um, and so To convert that to degrees. We know we have seven pi six and it's a negative and to convert to degrees. I know I'm multiplying by 180 degrees all over pi. So pi's cancel, six goes into 180 30 times. And so we're left with negative seven times, seven um, times 30. And negative seven times 30, well seven times three is 21. So this is negative 210 degrees. And so if we think of it that way, this is 180 degrees plus 30 degrees gets us our 210 degrees. Oh yeah, and then it's going the other way because it's negative. Negative, right. And so remember, and when we're looking at the reference angles, they're always gonna be positive and they always have to be between, like I said, that terminal side and either the negative or x positive x-axis, whichever one is gonna give us the smaller angle between zero and 90, or zero and pi halves. Okay, so depending on what quadrant we're in, depends on what sign your, your trigonometric function is gonna have. And so, we talked about our quadrants. We had our first quadrant in the upper right, and these were in Roman numerals. And we went counterclockwise, so we had quadrant one, two, three, and four. Professor? Uh huh. Uh, just making sure on the last one, so then, like, how there's pi over six, it would be the same as 30 degrees? Yeah. But if you're. If your example, if they tell you um, and they give it to you in radians, it's okay that you're switching to degrees to figure it out, but then you would have to go back to radians. So um, if this problem had started out and said, you know, find the reference angle of negative 210 degrees, our answer would be 30 degrees. Um, but because, and then I would have to figure out what that is in radians, which is pi six. Okay, thank you. But, yeah. So here's another um, one of those ways to help you maybe to memorize this, but I think that it's, it's pretty intuitive, but all students, so A for upper quadrant, S, take T calculus. And so depending on, um, this will tell you if our things are positive or negative. So A, in first quadrant, that's telling me all trig functions. Are positive. In quadrant one. So notation wise, when we writing what quadrant, we're just gonna do a capital Q and then what quadrant after it. Um, S, students, so this is in quadrant two. S represents the trigonometric functions that have um, sign in it, just sign. So quadrant two, 
sine to theta. And so the other trigonometric function, the um, reciprocal, one over sine theta, that's the other one that's positive in quadrant two. And that was the cosecant theta. So they're positive in quadrant two. Other ones are negative. Quadrant three, T, tangent. So tangent or any one that could be written with tangent. So cotangent. A positive in quadrant three and then quadrant four calculus cosine so any trig function with cosine so that would be cosine and um, secant theta Um, okay, this, this might make more sense in a minute, but let's look at an example. So let's look, find the exact value of our six trigonometric functions given that it lies at a particular point, so for instance. Um, a point on a terminal side of an angle theta in standard position is given. Find the exact value of the six trigonometric functions. And so let's say you're given the point negative one, negative two. So that point falls on the terminal side. Of our angle theta. Find the six trigonometric functions. Okay, so first thing we want to do is we want to plot this point. And so I'm given my x value is negative one and my y value is negative two. So if I plot that point, I have a point right here. So that just told me that my angle theta is falling in here. There's my terminal side, and we're looping it around, and this is theta. Okay, so when we find our terminal side like this, a lot of times we're going to form a right triangle with the positive or the negative x axis, depending on whichever one is closer. So kind of like the reference angle. So in this case, the, the reference angle is actually going to be in here. And we can form this triangle. So I'm making this triangle up. And we actually now know sides of our triangle. Right, because we know that this length in here from the origin to negative one is one. We know the length from here down, that is two. And then we have our, it's a right triangle because we made it a right triangle. And so let's call this right here, theta sub r.
So we want to find our six trigonometric um, functions. And theta sub r, those trigonometric functions are going to be the same as that of theta. Okay, so our trigonometric functions are ratio sides of a right triangle based off of the angle that you're looking at. We need all three sides. We should be able to find this piece right here. That's the hypotenuse. So Pythagorean theorem, we know that this piece right here is one squared plus two squared. So one squared plus two squared. So C squared is equal to one plus four, which is five, or C is equal to the square root of five. Okay, so now we want to look at um, cosine of theta sub bar, sine of theta sub bar, tangent of theta sub r. Okay, so cosine adjacent over our hypotenuse. So adjacent, which is, is the side that is sandwiched with this angle, but not the hypotenuse, so that is one, all over the hypotenuse, which we just found to be square root of five. So if I, um, Rationalize the denominator, I would get root 5 over 5. Think of the reciprocal function. Let's just do that real quick. And take the reciprocal before you rationalize the denominator so you don't have to re rationalize the denominator. If I took the reciprocal of 1 over root 5, that just gives me root 5. So sine theta, so sine theta sub r, that's opposite. So that's the two all over square root of five. Rationalize our denominator, multiply top and bottom by root five, you get two root five all over five. But the inverse function, our um, reciprocal function is cosecant. So again, before you had rationalized the denominator, look at that piece to take the reciprocal. So that would be root five over two. So tangent is opposite over adjacent. Opposite is four, adjacent is one. I'm sorry, I said, I think I said four, but it's two. Opposite is two, adjacent is one. So this is two and cotangent is the reciprocal. So that would be one half. Okay, so these are almost equivalent to what we would have gotten if we plugged in just theta. Only difference is we have to worry about is what quadrant we are falling in and which um, trig functions are positive in that quadrant and which trig functions are negative in that um, quadrant. So, we need to figure out which trig functions are positive and negative. in the quadrant. Uh -huh.
the terminal side falls in. Okay, so cosine. Another way that I, I memorize these or think about it is the kind of the sine. Well, we can talk about that later. But cosine um, down in the third quadrant is going to be negative. So instead of our cosine of theta is not really root five over five, it's negative root five over five. So cosine of theta is equal to negative root five over five. And secant, so secant of our original angle theta Secant is negative in quadrant three. So Wait, this professor? Is, yeah, negative root five. Professor, how is it um, negative root five over five again? It has to do with what quadrant. So it depends on what quadrant your angle actually falls in, depends on if your trigonometric function is positive or negative. And that's where we kind of talked about all students go to calculus. And so really the only positive ones in quadrant three are going to be positive. Um, the only the tangent or cotangent in tangent three is positive. So um, we can actually just use that to go back down here. So all of these um, trig functions that are reference angles that we found, they're going to be the same or the negative depending on the quadrant. So for sine, sine is negative in quadrant three, tangent's positive in quadrant three, so that would be the same. So sine theta. Okay, thank you. Yeah, is positive or negative, so negative two um, root five over five. Tangent of our original is positive, it's the same cosecant of the original angle is negative. So negative root five over two. And cotangent of the original angle, cotangent is positive in quadrant three. So, um, so, so since this, this right triangle is on quadrant three, you you follow the rule of all students take calculus because it says only tangent and cotangent are positive. Exactly, exactly. And once we kind of think of that, this assume we'll think about this as actually a unit circle, which means that our radius is always going to be one. And if you think about this, guys, basically our trig functions are written in terms of x and y. If we think of that, let's see, because it's actually really quite cool. Because we had talked about yesterday, it didn't matter, you know, how big our triangle was. As long as we had that same angles, we got the same ratios of sides. Um, and so if we can limit, and which we want to do, limit this hypotenuse always to be one, then notice that any point that you choose, so if I chose a point up here, x, y, let's just call it, it doesn't matter, um, and I make a a right triangle, this is always going to be x, right? And this is always length y. And maybe the absolute value depending, you know, if, if, if that value was negative or not. And so from this angle, adjacent is always your x value. Opposite is always your y value. So like if I plotted a point over here, like we had, this was negative x and this was negative y. Well, basically this right here, this is the absolute value of x is this length, right? And this is the absolute value of y 
is this length. That theta is always joined here, so opposite is our y value, adjacent is my x value. If I put something here, again, forming it with it, this is going to be my y value opposite, this is my x value. So it always actually ends that our, we can relate our trigonometric functions with our x and our y values. And they were calling them in your book A and B, but I tend to like this better. Um, so cosine of some theta is going to equal your adjacent, which is always going to be your x value, all over your hypotenuse. They call this R because we're thinking of a, a circle and that being a radius of a circle. Sine theta, I'm just jumping in and actually just giving this to you guys, y is over r. So opposite is your y value, your hypotenuse is r. Tangent theta, well, Sokotoa, opposite is your y, and then adjacent is your x. So if you can think of it as that, then you can kind of tell which one is positive and which one's going to be negative in which quadrant, because you know which value your points are positive or negative in those quadrant. So like in quadrant three, I know my x value is negative, and so a negative over positive is a negative. Quadrant three, my y value is negative, so a negative over positive is is negative. Where tangent, which we were said was the only one positive in here, it's y over x, a negative over a negative is a positive. Cotangent flips it, so a negative over a negative is still positive. And so that's how we get to determine how, if our function is positive or negative in which quadrant. And we'll definitely be talking we'll keep going over a lot of what we're saying again and again. And so if it's a little bit confusing right now, um, I think like in a day, you'll be kind of experts at this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm just looking at the time and I will definitely do a lot more examples. Let's take a break though. So let's meet back here at 11.35 this real quick. Okay, so we are going to just jump in and kind of do a lot of examples of what we were just doing. Um, and so let's look at the following. Let's say again, you're given a point. And so let's say your point that you're given is square root of 2 over 2, and then negative root 2 over 2. Okay, so we want to graph this, and if we graph this, which quadrant would we be falling in? Anyone know? If we plotted that point, root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2. Quadrant 4? Correct, quadrant 4. So here, and I'm just going to estimate. So this is our point, right, where, and then that line that goes through the point, that is going to be where the terminal side of our angle lies. So initial side, which starts at the standard position over here, so this is theta. And so we want to come um, make a triangle. So we can use trigonometry, the ratio of sides, and we can do that. And we always form it again with a, the x-axis, not with a y-axis. Okay, so that triangle that we're looking at
we know that the length, the upper side, is root 2 over 2. We know this side is also root 2 over 2. And so we want to figure out what the hypotenuse is. And so you'll notice that they call this R in the book. And so again, Pythagorean theorem. So we know R squared is equal to root 2 over 2 quantity squared plus root 2 over 2 quantity squared. Well, square root of 2 squared is 2 all over 2 squared, which is 4. So we get 2 fourths plus 2 fourths is 4 fourths, which is just 1. So can square root. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, can you scroll up a little bit up? Yeah. This Thank way? You. Yeah, OK. Um, the other way, I just need to see so um, for. Yeah, so our point. Oh, got it. So r squared is 1. Take the square root of both sides. So r is equal to 1. This is our angle that we're going to be using, which is our reference angle. So the reference angle, again, is the angle that um, is from the terminal side to the x-axis that makes it acute. So that would be this angle in here. So we're going to call that theta sub r. And I'm just going to write here. And you guys told me that that was in quadrant 3. So I'm going to do that little contained symbol. And then the q. No, what, you didn't say quadrant 3. You said quadrant 4. So that's going to help us at the end to figure out if the trigonometric function is positive or negative in that quadrant. Okay, so we have sine of theta r, cosine of theta sub r, um, tangent theta sub r. We have to figure out what those first six trigonometric functions are. And so ratio sides. So sine is opposite, which is root 2 over 2 divided by the hypotenuse 1. So we get root 2 all over 2. Um, for the reciprocal function, which is cosecant theta sub r, this is equal to the reciprocal of sine. So that's 2 all over root 2. Unfortunately, we have a radical in the denominator, so rationalize the denominator. So we get this is 2 square roots of 2 all over square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. Those cancel. And so we're left with cosecant of r cosecant of theta sub r is equal to just root 2. And then cosine of theta sub r, that's the adjacent side, which is root 2 over 2. And so secant of theta sub r, it's the reciprocal of that, which is the same thing as what sign was, the reciprocal sign, so we saw that that was just root 2. Tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, so root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2, which is just 1. So cotangent of theta sub r, reciprocal of 1 is just 1.
Okay, so now we're going to determine the signs of our trig functions by what quadrant we're in. So find trigonometric functions. At theta, determine the signs by the theta sub r contained in our case is quadrant four. So all students take calculus. Calculus is in quadrant four, cosine and um, the reciprocal function secant are the only trig functions posited if in quadrant four. Or think about your x and y values. Cosine has x, sine has y. y is negative in this quadrant, quadrant four. And cosine x is positive in quadrant four. Okay, so sine is going to be negative. Cosine is going to be positive. Um, tangent is going to be negative. Cosecant is going to be negative. Secant is going to be positive. And cotangent is going to be negative. When I do that, I don't have that that reference angle in there anymore. Oops. Professor, when you graphed, um, the square root of two, you uh -huh. would just like to to be able to graph that. You just do the square root of two, right, and then just follow like the decimal. And then just yeah. If you needed to figure out if you wanted to look at it more in detail, I just said that I'm just going to say this length right here is root two over two. But if you were looking at on graphing it, I I would have to plug that into a calculator to figure out you know the estimate of of where that would fall. Yeah, because it does like it's like one point forty something, so you would just put a little, a uh, little but bit then, after. But then you'd have to take so root two is that one point four, but then approximately, then you have to divide that by two, so you get approximately zero point seven is the distance. Uh, okay. But um, keep it with with the radicals in there and stuff when you're trying to figure out the ratio. Don't put it in decimal form. While oh, you're okay. Sorry, my chair has sunk, so <laughs> I'm not sitting as high as I normally am. Let me fix that, thanks. Um, okay, so we're gonna now relate this to angles instead of a point. And so we're gonna be given an angle and we're gonna try to find the six trigonometric functions given the, the angle. And so let's say you are trying, oh, actually, let's not say the six, just given one. So let's say it says find cosine of 600 degrees. So when you guys are doing these, this is what you probably, this is how you're going to set it up. So first thing that you guys want to do is graph the angle. So we want to figure out and we want to graph what cosine of, I'm sorry, we want to graph um, where 600 degrees is. Okay, so I know I have to go at least a full circle. That's 360 degrees. So if I subtract that, 
360 from 600, that would tell me what I have left over. So I have 240 degrees left over after making a, a full rotation. And so if I add, sorry, so 240, I know this is 180, 180 plus 60 more would get me my full 600 degrees. So once you've graphed it, you want to find your reference angle. Okay, so that's the angle again, the acute angle between the terminal side and the x-axis. So we would use the negative x-axis in this case. So you wanna find that length of that angle between there. Um, professor, did you say that the reference angle is negative? Reference angle is always going to be a positive um, angle. Okay, thank you. Yep. So that's like a, a known thing, like it's reference angle will always be positive. Yeah, it's always positive and it's acute. So it always has to be between zero and 90 degrees. And so that's why you're when and you're always forming it with a, an x axis. So basically, if you're in quadrant um, two or three, you're going to be forming it with a negative x-axis, where if your reference, um, if your terminal side of the angle fell in quadrant one, you're going to use the positive, or if it fell in quadrant four, you'd have to use the positive part of the x-axis. And, and you said it will be between zero and 90 degrees? Mm hmm Okay. So what, does anyone know what this angle in here? I've been there trying to access. 60 degrees? Yeah, so this is 60 degrees right in here. Okay, so it's not good. Um, okay, so we have it at a triangle, 60 degrees. Um, so then we want to evaluate your trigonometric function. At your reference angle. So we are trying to figure out what is cosine of 60 degrees. Okay, so we got our hand. 0, 30, 45, 60. Um, cosine was the number of fingers above our angle, so that's 1. So it was the square root of the number of fingers above, which is 1, all over, always 2. So this gives us 1 half. So once you've evaluated what the trigonometric function or functions are at that reference angle, then you're going to Um, determine the sign of the trigonometric function by what quadrant? the terminal side fell in. So cosine in quadrant three
So cosine theta in quadrant three is going to be negative. And then basically our answer is the sign that we got, we found, and um, the trigonometric, trigonometric function at that reference angle. So we're going to use the info. So answer, use information, info, um, info from steps three and four in our case. So our answer of cosine of 600 degrees, this is equal to technically negative cosine of 60 degrees, which we saw was negative one half. Um, professor, I have another question. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, so on number three, uh, I'm not I'm not completely sure how you got the numbers square root of one and two. Is that like the basic triangle we learned about yesterday? Mm -hmm. So that, um, yeah, that's a basic triangle. So we need to know cosine of 60 degrees and we can, we can form that triangle like we did and derive it. Basically that's the one you need to memorize. And then I kind of showed you guys that trick yesterday with the hand to figure out um, our trigonometric functions at particular angles. And so that's where I was doing. It's always remember the root n over two, depending on to find out what that ratio of sides was gonna be. And n had to do with the number of fingers above or below the angle we had found on our fingers. Cosine was number of above and sine was below. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't like it when my pen gets really um, skinny like that. So I find that just doing a new page gets rid of that problem. So I'm going to just do a new page. So let's say it says find sine of negative 240. And so all of these th ones that we're doing right now, you have to do without a calculator. So you couldn't just plug this into the calculator or have it spit out your answer. Um, so first step is to graph your angle. So theta is equal to negative 240 degrees. So we know that, that we're going to go clockwise, starting at the standard position. Um, so this is 90, 180. So from there, I kind of think to myself, what do I have to add to 180 to get up to 240, which is 60, which also helps me kind of figure out what my reference angle is. So right here, this is negative 240 degrees. So now we want to find our reference angle. So theta sub r. So we're trying to find this angle that is right in here. Always positive. And so we went from 180 to 240. That was 60 degrees. So once you find your reference angle, you're going to Evaluate your trigonometric function, in our case, sine, at that reference angle, 60 degrees. So again, written n over two, but sine is the number of fingers below that angle. So here's our zero degrees, 30 degrees, 45, 60 degrees. 
So number of fingers below is one, two, three. This is root three over two. And once you've determined that, is theta sub r falls in quadrant two. And we need, and we can see, or hopefully you know, sine is positive in quadrant two. Sine is a y value and it's positive in this quadrant. Um, So that tells me then that sine of my original angle, negative 240 degrees, is equal to the positive of what we found for our reference angle. So I really don't have to put that positive symbol there. I'm just stressing that it's positive. Is that the final answer? That's the final answer. Okay. Let's say it was secant of, where did it go? Negative three pi. So first thing you want to do is graph negative 3 pi. So I know 2 pi, that's a full rotation. And this is a negative, so I'm going to go clockwise. So full rotation, well, that's 2 pi or negative 2 pi. And so to get another, to get up to 3 pi, I need to do a pi, another pi, which I know is just 180 degrees. So that's just going to get me up to the negative x-axis. So negative three pi. Okay, this is a special angle because it's lying, the terminal side is lying on one of our um, axes. And so those were called again, quadrannal angles. So negative three pi. say quadrannal. So basically, we really don't have an angle there. Um, if we're thinking of it with a reference angle. Um, Um, how do I tell you? We haven't really, we haven't talked about quadrannal angles and evaluating our trig functions yet. Let's, let's first rewrite this. So secant of negative three pi, to me, I don't like that because, because it's not in terms of sine or cosine. So let's first rewrite secant. So I know that secant theta or secant of negative three pi This is equal to the same thing as one over cosine of negative three pi. And that's using that like uh, identity formula or something? Yeah, so that's just that by definition of secant, it's one over cosine, whatever the angle is. So yeah. I think we need to pause and actually look at quadrannal angles before we, we determine what this is. Um, and so let's come back to this in a minute. But let's look at our trigonometric functions at 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and 360. Or pi halves, pi, 3 pi halves, and 2 pi halves. Um, 
So we're going to looking at trigonometric functions where theta is a quadrantal angle. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of make a table here. So degrees, we have degrees. We have radians. And we have, it's not going to work. Um, the value. I need another space. Okay, in here we also need our trig functions. I probably should have written that. So we have sine theta, we have cosine theta, we have tangent theta, we have the other ones. Cosecant theta, secant theta, and cotangent theta. Not making a really good chart, guys. It's not following how I wanted it. That's <laughs> uh, because I did it like this. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. We got theta, and we have theta that is in degrees. We got theta, which is in radians. And then on, we have our six trig functions, sine theta, cosine theta, tangent theta. We'll talk about the other ones in a minute. So if we have zero degrees, If you have zero degrees, you're on the positive x-axis. It could be any size here. Notice that our R value is the same as the X value. And so in here, we have that sine theta, I was telling you before, was y over r. And notice in, uh, when it's zero degrees, the y value is zero. And so if I'm looking at zero degrees, well, that's zero radians, and sine of zero is zero over r which is zero, where cosine of theta, this is equal to length of x, it's always the, the all over r. Well, x and r are the same value. If they're the same value, then that would give us back one. tangent of theta that's opposite over adjacent or tangent theta another way to express this is y over x 
So if you have y is zero over some length of x, this is going to be zero. Okay, so unfortunately, some of our trigonometric functions, secant, cosecant, and cotangent, are reciprocals of these functions, and you can't divide by zero. And so some of these functions are undefined at quadrantal angles. Oops. And so um, cosecant theta at zero is undefined. Secant theta um, at zero, well, that's um, one over one, so that's one and cotangent theta is undefined. So we can do the same thing with the other, well, the other um, angles. So if we go 90 degrees, that gets us up to the positive y axis. That's the same thing as pi halves radians. So it's a little different when y, and you're on the y-axis. Your x value equals zero here. And your y and your r value are the same. And so if we're looking at sine is y over r, y and r are the same there. So sine of 90 degrees is one. X is zero here, and so cosine is zero. Tangent is opposite, or y, which is one over zero. So this is undefined. So next week we'll see graphs of these um, and we'll see that we have asymptotes there. Cosecant is one over sine, one over one is one. Secant is one over cosine, one over zero is undefined. Cotangent is x over y. And x is 0, y is 1, 0 over 1 is 0. So same kind of idea when we get to the negative portion of the x and the y axis. So we have 180 degrees, which is pi. This time, we think of x is equal to negative r. My x value is negative and over here. And so if I'm looking at sine, it's y over r, and y is 0. And so, Okay, so just go through the thing. Um, sine of y is zero, so we have zero over r is zero. Cosine, that is a negative r over r is negative one. Tangent, opposite, y is zero over negative one, or negative r is um, zero. Cosecant is undefined. Secant is negative one and cotangent is undefined. Two hundred and seventy degrees. That is at three pi halves. And so sine of two seventy. Well, our y value is negative. It's the same size as our r value, but negative. And so we get negative one. Cosine, x is zero, so we have zero. Tangent, it is um, 
y is zero, so this is undefined. I'm sorry, x is zero, undefined. Cosecant, one over sine, negative one. Undefined for secant, and cotangent is zero. And so we know that by the co-functions, 360 degrees added to any of those, or multiple of that 360 degrees would give us the same results. And so zero degrees is the same thing as 360 degrees, which is the same thing as two pi. Okay, so knowing that value, I know secant at 180 degrees, if I go back over here, secant at 180 degrees is negative one. And so this is the same thing as one over cosine of just pi, which is equal to one over negative one which is negative one. Okay, so I definitely did not get to word problems and we're pretty much out of time. So let me take a picture for roll. And let me stop the recording.